Hey everybody, welcome back to the Modern Customer Podcast. I'm your host, Blake Morgan. Today, my guest is Leanne Pierce, the VP of Client Experience at Betterment. Betterment is one of the companies highlighted in my Forbes 100 Most Customer-Centric Companies list. Today, we are talking about what Betterment does differently to run a customer-centric company. We'll be talking about leadership strategy, metrics, and how no employee should be above getting on the phone with a client. Betterment is the largest independent online financial advisor in the U.S. with almost 300 employees, managing $32 billion in assets. You will learn about metrics in this podcast. You will learn about how to be a customer-centric leader, and you will learn about how a technology company manages a technology experience without losing the human element. Please enjoy Leanne Pierce. Leanne, welcome to the Modern Customer Podcast all the way from Brooklyn, New York. How are you doing today? Hi, Blake. Thanks so much for having me. I'm doing great. It's a sunny, if chilly day in Brooklyn. Awesome. Well, you and I were having such a good time before I hit record chatting about motherhood and pregnancy. And I just appreciate you so much for being here because you told me that you are pregnant right now. And I just know like being pregnant, you don't have as much energy or maybe you do. I I had less energy, (laughs) but I just appreciate you being here and giving us your valuable energy today. Oh, well, I'm very happy to do it. I am in the second trimester, so I have more energy and less nausea yes. to give today. <laughs> yeah, and and that matters. So I'm so happy you're here. And we were talking about Betterment and just that you have a female CEO, female leadership. Um, so I do want to talk about leadership and strategy and, and what it's like to work um, with such a great leadership team, but let's step back, um, for my audience that don't know you, Leanne, can you just talk a little bit about your career history and how you landed into this role as VP of client experience for Betterment? Sure. Um, so a little bit about my background. I'm from North Carolina originally. Uh, I went to UNC Chapel Hill, so hopefully you have a lot of Tar Heel fans. Um, and I was in the Keenan Flagler Business School. That's where I did it undergrad. I had a mom who was very keen on Bachelor of Sciences. We were not allowed Bachelor of Arts, so oh. <laughs> that's, that's what I did. Um, And a lot of what you did post-college, if you graduated from Keenan Flagler, is consulting or banking. So I did the former, um, started out in consulting, which was amazing for just as a starting career, just the programs and and the skills that you learn. Um, But I ended up finding it wasn't for me. I thought I was going to love travel. Turns out travel for work is far less exciting. Yeah. Um, And had the opportunity to go work on the Obama campaign in 2008. Um, And I will say for anybody kind of regardless of political affiliation, campaigns are such an incredible place. It's just vibrant to be, you know, we were on the ground. I was building an office in Indiana, which I had never been to before. Um, And engaging with the community and, and just understanding all the pieces of it from like sales, marketing, operations, and all the stresses. And that was a big tech focus campaign. Tech was a big part of um, what made the field operations so successful. And for me, I was like, I don't want to go into politics. That seems terrible. Yeah. <laughs> I want to go into tech. Um, and so I, I made my way to New York after that was over and, and obviously successful um, and found myself in advertising technology, um, which obviously the advertising space in New York is huge. Um, and that was my real first foray and being able to work usually with venture back companies, uh, starting from series A to series F. So I've really been through all the stages and all different types of tech from advertising technology to health technology to uh, now financial technology at Betterment. Um, which is great because I'd been a long time client of theirs and also worked with a lot of people who ended up moving over to Betterment as well. So you know, a a great indication that you just always need to nurture your network. Because for me, that's one of the big reasons I ended up at Betterment where I am today. 
Yeah, I mean, Betterment as a company is not that old. It's a young company. Um, it, you know, it's an exciting tech company at a time when fintech just exploded. And now, like, the whole world of money, of finance, of consumer finance has just changed so much, and it's not slowing down. What do you think is different about the customer space in finance than prior to this explosion of technology? So Betterment's been around for about 12 to 13 years, which is a long time for in some ways in tech. Um, but certainly in the earlier days, it was so much harder to get people to trust, right, in digital banking. It was, yes, you had that, but still retail locations and just the idea um, that there was some sort of physical presence was something that people really associated so closely to the financial experience. And I think that's been one of the big changes, um, you know, from the neobank evolution to just mobile apps, right? Venmo, PayPal, the explosion of those. People are now so much more accustomed to their phone yeah. being, you know, their financial tool um, in a way that they never were before. And I think that's only going to continue to accelerate. And that's certainly been a big change that we've seen um, over the, the lifetime of Betterment as a platform. Yeah, and obviously trusting AI with your money is, you know, a big leap. Is um but before we talk about AI and and the model, um can we just actually talk about your scope and your role because that's actually why a lot of people tune in, you know, customer experience looks different at every company and the leader of customer experience is different at every company. It's never the same. Can you just talk about your scope and what that looks like for our audience watching and listening? Sure. So um, to just anchor everybody in, in what client experience really even means at Betterment, and then I'll go a little bit into the scope. Obviously, we are a digital first platform. That's what we do, um, providing investment and retirement solutions, and then also um, saving and banking related products. The So for us, the, pro the client experience is really a product first experience. And then there are also all of those other touch points where a client might need to engage with a human. They might be engaging with us in content form. And so there's really such a product centricity to our client experience. Um, so that it serves as a really key part of how we think of everything that we do. Um, but when you think about the client experience team at Betterment, uh, which is the, the organization that I lead, that would actually be the humans that serve to not just be there where you need additional human reassurance or issue resolution uh, or guidance in your financial experience, but also to serve as constant sources of that input of where do we add to our product experience so that people better understand it, can more seamlessly navigate financial matters that we constantly seek to make more uh, less complicated for them. So my team is really both those frontline call center support group, um, as well as license experts that you can work with that help you with everything from moving money to planning for your financial future. Yes. So one of the topics that has come up quite a bit, just I've noticed in my own customer experience community out there is how does a potential recession impact customer experience? What are you seeing? Are you guys making any changes just either out there or at Betterment with regard to this topic? So we've, um, there's a few different ways that we've um, made changes from the business side and specifically with client experience. One thing from the business side is, as we certainly notice it because a recession usually means, you know, both behaviorally, emotionally, uh, and just practically that a lot of people think more about cash savings than they think about, right, investing for retirement and the long term and putting money in the market. Um, and so even just the product what products people are using, we've noticed a massive shift. Um, from a client experience perspective, I think really the recession 
for me as a leader indicates just volatility or instability that we have to be mindful of. And so um, we're thinking and have been thinking about it in, in one of two ways. One is how do we continue to use things like tooling to make our teams more efficient since we're not really able to predict at growth at the same rates, right? We went from 2020 and in the pandemic to 2021, which was hyper growth, to 2022 that felt uh, much more uncertain. And so tooling like uh, chatbots really help us not focus on just growing our team from a personnel perspective, but actually growing our team's impact um, and making them more targeted in the work that they're doing, as well as being able to help our clients get in the moment feedback through using tooling uh, because they're able to just access a chat right there when they're looking for something um, and most of the time get the answer they need. The mm -hmm. second thing that we're looking at is a lot of times during these periods, for, especially from a financial perspective, People want more human reassurance. They want more guidance. And so that's a big focus for us on the client experience side, which is how do we provide more of that? As I mentioned, we have these teams of licensed experts. How do we help through that, through marketing and, and the content that we provide? How do we be uh, a more of a resource for people as they also bear the uncertainty of the markets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one of the things that I wanted to bring up to you today and talk about, Leanne, is digital transformation. And I understand you guys went through digital transformation, but you were already a digital tech company. So what did that look like? So from our side, digital transformation is sort of, I would say in a lot of ways, our lifeblood yeah. <laughs> because we are a digital tech company. You're just constantly needing to think through what that means for clients. Um, so I'll give a couple different examples of what that looks like for us. First, as I mentioned, we started as a digital first business. We were always a web platform. That's where most people accessed their finances. And even then, in some ways, right, not having the retail location um, was more controversial. Mm -hmm. The over the past couple of years, it's been notable how many of our clients are shifting to mobile first, as I mentioned, all the different apps that people use and have gotten accustomed to. And so for us, digital transformation also really meant shifting more of our platform and more of the access to the common things people would be doing there, whether it was, you know, deposits, creating goals. There's so many things that people will do on their phones from a financial planning and investment perspective. And um, while that hadn't necessarily been part of the original strategy when we started, that's certainly a core part of the strategy as we continue. Absolutely, um, yeah. And then the other thing, as I mentioned a little bit is uh, in regards to things like chat, just tooling. I think, again, people are, expecting more from their platforms in terms of the ability to be really custom to who they are and what they need. And what we've seen in, in both studies through partners and through our own usage is, is more millennials and, and Gen Zs want actually to use things like chat tools. They don't want to have to call somebody or even email somebody. They just want access and support in the moment. And so as we think about the client experience and how they navigate our platform, really adding tooling that people can access um, and things like chat that can be more AI driven, but also be more in the moment for the user because that's those are users that are very comfortable with those tools. Leanne, one of the things we talk about on this show quite a bit, because it's just such a hard thing to crack, is measurement. How do you know every day that you've done a good job at work? And one of the, you know, most, I would say, business people today in customer experience are still using Net Promoter Score. I have to ask every guest, what are you using? How are you measuring customer experience? Sure. Wow. Yes. Measurement is always going to be a big question. Um, and I think it's going to always be ever evolving. Uh, there's a lot of different things that we look at. 
the the way that I really book it is is kind of into three groups, which hopefully people will follow with me here. Um, the first group is is more of the front lines metrics, and and for us, again, that is composed of two areas. One is the product driven metrics, the funnels of how do people navigate your website, your app, et cetera. How many people are starting? Where are they stopping? Who's actually finishing it? And you know why and why not? Those are things we're looking at really routinely just to know, is this thing working? Do people understand it? Do they know what they're doing? Uh, do they feel confident in the process? And is it quick enough, right? We know that things, people have limited attention spans, but it also, we don't need it, want it to be burdensome. The same is true is also for the support style metrics, the how long are wait times. There's nothing worse than calling a place when you have something urgent and not being able to get a hold of the support team and get an answer for what you need. Um, so a lot of those are our leading indicators for what we're looking at. The second group, which is a lot of our insights, which yes, does include MPS, mm -hmm. but I would say includes a lot of different uh, quantitative, but also really it's the qualitative insights that we want, which are MPS, CSAT, it's end of year surveys, it's uh, exit surveys, um, and targeted points in time or targeted customer journey surveys that our insights team will do that allows us to go deeper on those aspects of how is a client engaging? What are they getting value out of? Where are they getting stuck? And what are the details about that? That really allows us more, you know, it's really taking those anecdotes of what you might hear and getting it at the aggregate level to better understand where you have breakdown, but also what people value out of your product. Um, and so I think those are really important, um, but I think you kind of have to take all of it together. Uh, and then the third bucket is financial metrics. I think any customer experience leader is needs to be proficient in these, everything from upsell, cross-sell, retention and it's not just about the health of your business but it's really about what are your clients doing that indicate that they value your product but also indicate that they value the things that you're building and that you're investing in and where do you need to make shifts or continue to double down on um, so for me that's a lot from a measurement perspective and certainly we can't look at it all every day but i think all three buckets of those are just really important to measure. Um, and I think, again, it sort of takes some of the pressure off of the, the controversy of NPS because it really just shouldn't be the standalone for how you measure success um, of your client experience and, and how much your clients are valuing uh, what your business is offering. All right. So because you said it, I will ask you, Leanne, why do you think NPS is so controversial? I think I think as a standalone metric, it is really controversial because there's just so only so much you can get from would you would you promote this? Would you recommend this brand? Um, and I think usually if you're not accompanying it uh, the way that we usually do with a lot of other qualitative insights, it just really doesn't hit the mark for giving you any sense of precision on how do you make impact. Um, and I mm -hmm. think that's just the reality of, of working in the digital world these days. We have access to so many metrics. You just can't be that dependent on MPS. And I think it's mostly controversial because at some point it's felt like the end all be all. But the reality is like it has to be in your por portfolio, you can't just be reliant on that as the sole anchor for are you doing well or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it just doesn't give you enough information. And also, what if uh, what if your best customers don't respond? <laughs> yes, exactly. I, well, yes, I think also you think about it, right? Like we've all used and seen Yelp or any of these like public review platforms. And it, they do tend to just drive towards the people who have, who are the angriest or the, they just Ooh. drive towards the extremes, which then yeah. makes you really miss out on 
your core middle, the folks that you really are, pro that's probably your target audience that isn't bothering to respond. And so that's why it's just really important to have such a variety of touch points to better understand both who you're serving and what it is that they actually care about. Mm -hmm. Leanne, one of the things that I hear a lot about and I think is just a big topic right now is how to develop customer-focused leadership. And since you've done so many things and you literally are a customer-focused leader today, what does that term mean to you? I think the thing for me around a customer-focused leader, and I think we're hearing about this a little bit more, but it's both somebody who's passionate about the product. I think that's really important, right? Whatever your business is, you want somebody who's really passionate about it, but you don't want that to also then overshadow the desire to understand who your user is. And I think that second part is the most important part. I think that's what it really means is how do you make sure everyone in your business understands who your user is and is empathetic to that? Because I think a lot of times, I mean, I have to do this at Betterment all the time because I was a longtime client but I can't cast myself as the target client because I, I might not be. And I have to remember um, that really I just want to understand and I want to make sure everybody understands who it is that we're serving um, and how that evolves in time. And so I really think it is about people being passionate to start, but the secondly, uh, a leadership culture and really an, an everybody in the company culture of I want to understand who this person is and, and why this product matters to them. So for our audience that want to have that customer-centric leadership culture that Betterment has, do you have a tip for them on how they can start to create that culture and plant those seeds? One of my biggest tips is nobody's above taking a call with a client. I think that's such a big, I mean, I'm a VP. I, I take, I took a call with a client, um, two weeks ago, you know, it's, it, you've just got to one, be willing to engage. Um, and even if that's not accessible to you, then making sure that there is transparency and access to the direct client feedback. I think that's mm -hmm. such a big part of people understanding and making sure that's a continuous feedback loop within your organization. Because again, with as with everybody's company as it evolves, that what that user needs or wants can change, right? With trends that are happening in the ecosystem or just as they age and have different needs. And so um, I think one, just making sure that there's that sense of no one's above it. And in fact, people should seek it out. Um, and then two, uh, making sure that that's just a consistent part of the dialogue so that there is this knowledge of, of who is it that we're helping make their lives better. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's so great. Um, so just we're, we're nearing the end of our time together. Do you have any remaining tips for people out there that want to have the career like you've had where you are deep in the heart of customer experience? You've had a successful track record of working in tech companies. You've clearly married tech and culture really well together. What advice do you have for other people in their careers who want to have the success that you've had and be a leader in client experience? There are a few things that I would say that I try to keep in mind, regardless of where I am, that I think have, have served me well. I think the first thing is is know that the, this is the job. Know that the job, right, is to understand where the pain points are. And there's always going to be some mess that you're coming in for. And, and don't let that be a stress to you. Don't look at it and think, I need to reorganize the whole closet on day one. Just know that that's the part. It's like there's always going to be new things for you to tackle and evolve um, and prioritize. And uh, I think it's just really important to – you never want to feel like the job is done because that's the reality of it. There's always going to be new things, hopefully, that are challenging you. Um, I would say that the second thing is there's a lot of advice out there 
and I really, I love how much the customer success client experience field is actually seeing more and more. Um, I find it to be a burgeoning area of like thought leadership uh, and written content and, and pieces. But do keep in mind that everybody's experience is going to be different and really anchor what you need to do to the stage of your business. Know that really well. Know the client stage with using your product really well. Um, and make sure that you're not just taking the latest advice. Make mm. sure that you're really knowing those pieces first and then deciding whether the latest advice works for you or not because of stage and constraints and, and focus areas. Um, I think that can often happen uh, to people where they feel like, oh, I've got to do this because everybody else is getting this. And the reality is like, it might not work for you yet. So just take the baby steps and again, be be comfortable in that process. Um, and then the final piece is, I just think from a, I think client experience or customer success, however it's named, understanding the customer and making sure people understand that is a cross-functional role. And one of the best things that you can do to be successful in your role is to build relationships with those cross-functional leaders that are going to be your key partners. I don't do anything alone. If it wasn't for product and marketing and operations and all of these other teams, you know, my team wouldn't exist and wouldn't be successful. And so I think that that's such a key part of my success, any organization that I'm in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's so wise. And that is the challenge with the role that a lot of people get hired. They think they need to save the company alone and it's just not possible. So I think you're absolutely right. It's about trusting your gut, not listening to every thought leadership thing that comes along, not trying to be someone or some customer leader that you're not and just being honest and always focusing on the pain points. Like you said, there's so much value in being connected to the customer and getting on the phone with them directly. So I think you have some great tips that you've shared with us today. And before we let you go, we want to get to know you a little bit better on a personal level. So are you ready for some rapid fire questions, Leanne? I'm ready. You're ready. Okay. I hope. Okay. <laughs> I already knew you were ready. Okay. So firstly, what does your morning routine look like? My morning routine, I'm going to give you the full lineup. Okay. I play all the, I play all the world, the word games. Okay. I do Quirtle to Waffle to Wordle to a Spanish Wordle. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and then my husband is our barista, which I very much appreciate. And my hot tip is if you don't have a foamer at your house, get it. It's the best hundred dollars you'll spend. Yeah. And I have that. And then I either am on duty to get my daughter ready for school, for preschool, or I am getting myself ready so I can walk her to school every day. So oh. that's my lineup. I love that. Yeah, I'm with you. Cough, yeah, definitely coffee sometime for, it's funny, I'm not supposed to be interrupting rapid fire, but because you're pregnant and we're talking about mom stuff, I think you're my friend. Anyway, I'm not supposed to be interrupting you, but I'm with you. I'm like, coffee, got to have that coffee in the morning. All right, next, do you have a leadership hack that helped get you to where you are? My biggest leadership hack is the relationships I've built, I, both from mentorship to just being that venting sounding board to being, you know, a referral or a vouch for me. Um, and so relationships, it doesn't have to be people are ahead of you. I find so many of my peers that I worked with at various stages ended up being both my biggest advocates and um, my biggest assets as I've continued to grow in my career. What do you do to relax at the end of a hectic day? We, my husband and I love to do the New York Times crossword, which is really amazing um, as just like a good decompressor. Uh, and then mm -hmm. also my daughter has started doing a dance party where she turns off the lights. She makes us turn oh. off all the lights and we play one song and we have to wear sunglasses and you dance. And I will tell you to just have no care in the world and wear sunglasses in the dark in your house while dancing for three minutes is a really good way to relax. <laughs> I love that. What's your idea of perfect happiness? It is no obligations and contentment in the morning, in the moment. 
-hmm. just the idea of doing exactly i i i mean the my smallest example is i take a walk as, as often as i can during the week i try and prioritize a walk around prospect park and listening to music and having it be sunny and walking a loop in the park is just true happiness to me. It just totally content and you just love where you are, you love who you are, um, and you love the people that you're gonna be with. Yes, absolutely. What is your favorite type of vacation? I am not a good pure vacation relaxer. Mm -hmm. So I love hiking, I love, activity vacations. So we like to plan uh, like this spring for spring break, we're going to Bryce Canyon in Zion National Park. And I mm -hmm. love just being outside. I think it's also New York. You know, you live in the city, so you get all of that. So for vacation, I like to be in like remote wilderness and just walking and taking it in. I love that. If you could have lunch with anyone dead or alive, who would it be? Oh, gosh. I'm terrible with these types of questions. <laughs> a, lot of people say, um, a lot of people say Obama, which you probably ha did have lunch with him. So you can't say that. <laughs> yes. Um, I don't know. I think I would, I think I'm more of like, I would want to hang out with somebody. I would want to have lunch with somebody I know would be like super fun. So I feel like it would be like Rihanna, like right mm -hmm. now, and she's pregnant right now. It's yeah. definitely like a Rihanna. I just loved her performance. She was just like, I don't need to work that hard. Like, I'm awesome. I'm not doing choreography. Like, I'm good enough. And I just, I loved her super time, her Super Bowl halftime show. Me too. And she did Fenty promotion. I mean, I just love, yes, it, we all need to like embrace the aura of Rihanna. Rihanna. You are good enough yes. and you can make a big business. Well, that actually might answer the last question, which is, if you had to describe your outlook in one quick motto, what would it be? Um, my outlook or my motto would be to don't sweat things, but to try very hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I think I would need to workshop the words, but I think you got the idea. It's like, I don't. I try not to stress about the things that are happening, but I'm also someone who is very intentional and very intense about the things that I do. That I think if you're going to do it, why bother if you're not going to show up to compete? I love that. I think that is a perfect way to wrap up this amazing interview. And I hope that you'll come back maybe after your maternity leave and share all this new success you're having at Betterment. Um, I guess that would be next year. So will you come back? Yes, I would be happy to. Thanks oh, for good. having me. Oh, good, Leanne. Well, this was so fun. Everybody, you have been tuning in to the Modern Customer Podcast. Until next time, thank you for listening.